Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. It's Dr. B and today we will consider methamphetamines and we'll do it in a cool way. We'll come at it from a mental health perspective and a medical perspective. I'm joined again with Parham. He master's degree in uh, marriage and family therapy, a long history of treating substance abuse. All of his credentials are below in the link. Parham, how are you? I'm doing good. Happy to be here again and happy to talk on the specific topic of methamphetamines and the impact that it has in the mind, body, spirit, soul of human beings. Yeah, we've done this before in lives, and I just thought it's a good time to revisit it. If you guys, some of you guys don't know, uh, besides being a therapist, he's also chief of operations and previously chief clinical officer for um, intensive outpatient treatment for substance abuse that he, Buckeye Recovery, that he runs in Orange County. Paroma, you know, we, we did something like this on benzos. So, you know, what percentage of patients are purely methamphetamines that come uh, to your program? This one's a little bit high. I'd say like 20%. 20%. Yeah. And I think the reason, main reason for that is nowadays, everyone's poly substance abuse. Yeah. Okay? And then there's another nuance to this is the garbage out there nowadays, it's all garbage, but it's just cut up with everything, right? So, yeah. so if you're doing meth long enough, you might be doing fentanyl, MDMA, all the other stuff with it, right? So uh, 20%. Okay. And uh, these guys are coming out of detox, coming into intensive outpatient treatment, which for those of you that don't know, it's sort of the, I don't use the term uh, gold standard for anything we do in substance abuse because we don't have a high enough outcome results all of us but people coming in usually uh, is there any nuances particular to methamphetamine mental health approaches in groups and in, probably mo mostly in individual sessions is there any nuances that we need to understand and uh, what you do and can you give some tips out there yeah you know when doc was talking about the gold standard there it's the, the continuum of care right so there's this medical detox component which meth depending on what you're using may or may not need a full medical detox and there's residential care which you know, it's, it's probably like a structured 30 day program, we'll call it and against a cookie cutter number. But it's important because if you're actively using a drug that has that abuse potential and psychologically it's that addicting, not being in a structured environment, it's really hard to not just relapse quickly before you even have an opportunity to recover or heal or even get exposed to the information or the tools. And then it comes down to the outpatient level of care, which is something that I'm, you know, that's what I've been doing for a long time. And it's, it's, got different modalities in there and it's got different approaches from group therapy to individual therapy, some holistic stuff, a lot of education for the individual and their families. But with methamphetamine use, what I've at least seen uh, historically is there oftentimes, again, going back to, you know, when it all started, there's oftentimes a prior diagnosis and not always. And sometimes it is diagnosed, sometimes it's missed, but of ADHD. Mm -hmm. And it's the exposure to the ADHD medications that are prescribed, such as the Adderalls or the Concertas, you know, Ritalins at a young age. And again, that medication assists that individual at that age to be able to potentially focus, to be able to not act out in certain behaviors, to be able to kind of function on a day-to-day -day basis doing the little things that kids do. However, the root cause of why that individual is unable to pay attention, why that individual is unable to be present in a room, why do they just daydream or why do they have such a hard time regulating their emotions, that never gets addressed. So now the individual gets a little older. And by the way, a lot of people that have uh, ADHD that get exposed to those medications at a young age, they self-report that they hated the way that it made them feel. A lot of them took away their personality. Sometimes they would cheek them, tell their parents they took them and not use them, but they had a need for them at that point. And then later on, because because of a specific lifestyle that they might get introduced to, just the chaos that might be in their world, they get introduced to the world of methamphetamines and the potency of that drug is so much higher than these medications we're talking about. And all of a sudden they get that high of feeling good. And what feeling good to them is they're finally engaged in life. Most people that use meth, the early reports is they are able to do all the things they ever wanted to do, but they're unable to do it. They get this new sense of energy, this new sense of vitality, some passion for life. They're talking, they're engaged, they're working hard, they're doing all this really stuff that they deserve to do, but they were unable to do. But now we're in the illicit drug world with God knows what's inside these medications. And methamphetamines is one of those drugs that, you know, even though it's widely used on channels like this of individuals watching it, it's not, you know, in the grand scheme of society, it's not that big. So it's a subculture. And that subculture of methamphetamine use, it's a world of its own. And once you get into that and that becomes the norm, the chaos that exists in that world you gotta get addicted to that chaos you get addicted to that lifestyle and before you know it, you're on a roller coaster that i always say you know death the meth is one of those drugs that has demonic effects because too much dopamine 
which is what it releases, ultimately can lead a person to a drug-induced psychosis, psychotic stages. And those psychotic stages, psychosis, I mean, bad things can happen. I mean, whether it's the paranoia you experience, whether it's the delusions you experience, whether it's the grandiosity and, you know, speaking to, you know, powers that may or may not exist, but then the impact it has on families and, and let alone the impacts that it has on, you know, personal self-esteem and, and just the way you look and the way you present yourself. And it gets very, very, very intrusive to all areas of life. And individuals that seek treatment for this, oftentimes there is poly substance use here with methamphetamines also. You know, anything that goes up, individuals like something that goes down with it. Um, sleep patterns, disruptions, all that kind of stuff. So when a person comes to treatment, again, why are you seeking treatment for this specific medication? Why do you want to get off it? And then the goal is to go back and find out, you know, when, uh, I know I sound like a broken label here, but the reason I like to go back is if you don't go to the roots of when something started, how can you deal with the outcome? You know, it's really hard to understand the end of a movie if you don't know how the movie started. It's practically impossible. You can't read the last chapter of a book and know exactly what how it got there. And a lot of people just deal with the end. But in order to understand the end, you have to get to the beginning. So just like most drugs, meth is also there. You need to know the origin, when and where did that individual get introduced to these type of you know substances, what it did for them in a good way, and uh, what what it, what they continue to get out of it. So that's kind of my intro on this talk. You know, I want to be short. But you you uh, nail, uh, hit topics that I could probably do a year podcast. Some of it myself, some of it with you, some of it with uh, other experts in particular. But you brought up the issue of childhood attention uh, deficit yeah. issues and uh, medicating these children. And uh, you know, the only thing I will say about this is that there's a lot of both clinical and greater social and even bigger philosophical issues in a society that's more and more to succeed and move ahead. There's a demand place of a very regimented, autonomous sort of processed individual. And all these kids that we're calling abnormal or need for medication are actually just being normal humans. And that is their temperament, personality and issues. And we're shoving them in to succeed. And what? I did, uh, you know, so this is a big issue, the medication for the children, the relationship with ADHD and methamphetamine later in life or adult onset HDAD, all all of that stuff. But what I want to concentrate on is the acute withdrawals and what we do, what I do clinically for myself and how it presents to me. One other point that I want to bring up that Param has sort of touched on is this stuff is corrosive. It's corrosive to the central nervous system uh, considerably. And there are changes you see in a person and uh, it's intense, uh, cognitive, emotional, neuropsychiatric, right? Fine motor movements. And uh, some of it can be long lasting, right? And in fact, the literature at this point is pretty clear that mental health care is the first line to go and contingency management, I think they call it, right? Uh, Which is uh, really the leading recommendation for stimulant abuse. And it started in the 90s with treating cocaine addicts, which is sort of a reward and kind of a punishment thing. Okay. All of that said, uh, you know, uh, I also suffer from the same thing Parham suffers. Most of this is poly substance abuse. If it was pure methamphetamines that someone came in, and at the end, I'll point out to potential new therapeutic modalities that are on the rise, but sort of fringe right now, and some folks are doing it. But, you know, if someone came in just for methamphetamine abuse, really, and they're going through the withdrawals, here. Number one, I would really want to get them in mental health. But the only medication really that can be used right now is supportive medication, right? You know, those immediate acute withdrawals for the first several days, couple of weeks, you know, the person might be hyper, they might be sleeping for three days. Yeah. They might be absolutely not eating or maybe hyper eating, yeah. you know, uh, all of that stuff. And I say uh, all of that stuff is okay because you are replenishing neurotransmitters and adjusting the dopamine and all the serotonin, all that other stuff. And the key is really to keep them off of doing methamphetamines. And if I need to, you know, I'll give supplemental medication, you know, for sleep, right? For a mood. I just kind of want them to stay hydrated. And I think it's crucial for them to keep in close contact with the provider. Uh, As time goes on, you know, then you start adding therapeutics and it needs to be mental health therapeutics, really engagement. And you want to be able to give them supportive 
supportive medications for all of those things that may have led them into this. Uh, you know, if, if insomnia is an issue, you want to take care. You want to take care of sleep structure and hygiene. You want to take care of mood stuff. You want to get them moving on their own. Exercise to get the natural dopamine and endorphins going. And those are the things I focus on. And going back to a few basic medication, if I have to, to keep those other things sort of in line and adjust as, as best as I can. Usually it's poly substance abuse that hits me and let's just take a classic one and it's oftentimes nowadays more it's sort of opiates and meth together yeah. and the way i deal with that is uh, uh you know as many of you know I, i'm a big uh, advocate of medication assisted treatment for opiates and uh, people often come in and they minimize their methamphetamine use they're like oh, a couple times a week three times a week and i don't even deal with that i uh, get their opiate issue in line with medication assisted treatment and one of the things I do, and this is, uh, I think, critical because a lot of places, if you go into a detox, you got to come off of everything. I don't even touch your methamphetamine issues. First, I get what I can under control for the first two, three weeks and just really... Uh, advocate for you to, you know what, stop doing meth, slow it down, but I want measurements. Once I get my suboxone titrated, that titration includes your methamphetamine use in my mind, because with buprenorphine products, I can do a lot in terms of sleep and anxiety, believe it or not, depression. Once I get that fit as best as I can. Now I can see where your meth abuse is really. And we're not talking about months. We're talking about a couple of weeks. And that's why it's important to see your provider regularly. If they're doing that, I don't know uh, if everyone has that in their mind. Then I start really uh, keeping you in sort of a string attached to me where you don't go out for a month with your buprenorphine products and say, all right, get off the meth. I'm going to try and push for you to get help in terms of mental health. Yeah. But you're going to see me every week and we're going to work on the nuances of mindful being mindful about how much methamphetamine you're taking in and you know uh, it takes people a minute to be comfortable with the fact that you know to be honest with me because i'm like look dude i don't care i did we got to get this under control and then we start shaving off of that and hitting every other area in their life that might be contributing to that like you said that might be adhd there might be the, uh, depression, anxiety. Yeah, yeah. And believe it or not, methamphetamine is the way they work in terms of ADHD. Uh, you know, stimulants could put an ADHD person to sleep. I'm going to let you think about why that is, right? Now, the one treatment modality that is oftentimes looked down upon is giving prescribed stimulants as replacement therapy for methamphetamine yeah. abuse. And there are guys that are actually publishing and trying high dose of prescribed stimulants to replace methamphetamine addiction. And they're having some success with these outcomes. I haven't done it too much. I have in the past and it's worked in certain places. And I'm going to certainly start looking at that more closely. But a lot of the providers look down upon that and are uncomfortable with that. And again, the stigma around these things, you know, the drug itself is not good or bad. You have to think about the outcome for the patient risk versus benefit, yeah. right? He's slamming a two grams of a uh, meth a day and it's chopped up who knows where and what it has in it and all the pollutants and dilutants. No, no, no. You get something prescribed. It's like alcohol replacement therapy, right? Benzos, whatever. You're prescribing it. At least now you're controlling the medication and you also know what's going in the sure. drug. And that's got to be a lot better than inhaling something, sniffing something, injecting something that's manufactured illicitly and you're dealing with a drug dealer. And that's something that you guys should look up, uh, look into. And it's sort of on the horizon. I, I don't know how much hold it's getting, but really uh, th that's it. That's it. The mental health part is uh, kind of, uh, if we go by evidence right now, that's the first recommendation. But I can tell you that from a clinical provider side, medical provider side, that has to be in concert with at least supportive medication for those that need it. And uh, that's where we're at on this issue. It's it's a tough one. Yeah. And if the free resource out there, there's something called the matrix model for stimulant mm -hmm. addiction. Yeah, yeah. So if you just Google matrix model, stimulant addiction, it's specifically for methamphetamines. 
It actually is a relatively decent self-guided workbook, even preferably with a professional. But for those of you who are unable to have the resources to see a professional, something, go check it out. Free PDF download. They have it for family members for them to understand a little bit more about stimulant addiction. And it's published by Sam Shub, I believe. So yeah, it's, 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 uh, yeah. yeah it's, it's decent stuff. So if you don't, if you want to start somewhere and you, you don't have access to a provider and you want to see what you can do to find some ways to get off the meth, that's a decent place to kind of start. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I agree. That's a yeah, matrix model right there. Okay, that's it for that one. So methamphetamine addiction, some of the approaches in terms of mental health and uh, medical clinically, what we have to offer you. Hit the like and subscribe. Consider us for channel membership. I hope the material we gave today is useful and beneficial. Know that you're never alone. We try our best to give you support even in that online world. And uh, that's it for me. That's all we got. Anything else? That's all, man. Have a wonderful one. Take care, guys.